All right, guys, and welcome back to part two of this week's Yawa. Yes, and we want to make an announcement. We're making an announcement in every part this week because we're making a little bit of a transition. So previously, we've been asking for our Yawa questions on our social media platforms, uh, Facebook and Instagram primarily, but we also take, you know, emailed in questions, messaged in questions, texted in questions, um, as well as uh, we want to take some more questions from YouTube. That's where we, you know, are posting these videos. So that's where we want to start taking some of the questions from or the mo most of the questions. So if you have a question and you want it answered on Yawa, reply or comment, comment. Yeah, comment. Yeah. it's called commenting, da, da, da. whatever, replying, comment commenting. This video. Yes, these videos. And then we can go through and pull up these videos and pull questions for next week's Yawa right from here. Oop, bong. Absolutely. Bong. I wanted to say uh, thanks to Lee. Everybody wants to know what we're drinking. Cat is on the red beerish kick with one of those styling koozies. Yeah, these are uh, on our website as well. Mission Mercantile leather koozies. And it's really cool. They've got magnets. Is this magnetic? Ooh. <laughs> it is. It's like my new. I don't know if you can see that 100% on the video. You I have to bring it in a little closer. You can't come in any closer. Yeah, can't you do that inside of that? That for sure. No. Oh. I'm no, right here. This right is as there. close as it can get. Oh, it's got to be on the frame. Like yeah, got to be on the frame. Okay, well, hopefully I think it that. can see that. I mean, otherwise it's like literally cutting the video off like right by my face. So I'm I sure it can know. see that. But it's magnetic, so you can like magnetic it to things. Yep. Magnetic, whatever. Um, I am drinking Journeyman Distillery's Last Feather Rye, which is a really, really cool label on it. This came from Lee, um, a good client and friend of ours. And I wanted to say thank you for that. And I am uh, just blurting out things that I taste as we go because I'm trying to figure out this is it's a very tasty rye and it has a lot of interesting, you know, very subtle undertones to stuff here. So yeah. far, we've established it's rye ish, spicy, peppery, kind of like a typical rye is. But it does have a hint of a little bit of vanilla in there and maybe some like a go to flavor just you could you could pretty much open any american or bourbon or rye whiskey and say i taste caramel that's a it's a real and if you said that people would be like oh yeah yeah it's there so, so you know tip whiskey tasting tip of the just day say it tastes like caramel and yeah, I, I taste hints of you've got caramel a very here. refined mm. palate then is that what that means I, I don't know what it means well whatever it means we're going to start answering some questions this question, which is really fun because it kind of ties back in with last week's Yawa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Read it. I'm getting there. Okay. From Jed underscore Ellie May underscore the Britneys on Instagram. Montana hunting tips, planning our first trip for September. So I wanted to, Ooh. I wanted to answer this question because, Ooh. right? We um, talked about our Montana trip that we're planning in our last Yawa, where we're actually taking Ada and our son with us, um, which is going to be interesting and definitely a little yeah, bit different than exciting. any hunting trip we've ever taken before because, you yeah. know, we've got a toddler with us. But so we're going to be doing some review stuff. I've got some folks that have already sent in some things. Thank you very much. Yes, we appreciate. Um, since he's our first, we and we've never gone on a hunting trip with him like this before. It was, it was Chet sent in. Um, like a baby a backpack yeah, type of thing. Like a backpack designed for more hiking and outdoor stuff to and for to toddlers. More of a toddler sized child. Because yeah. we have like the ergo baby infant sized one, which he's outgrown by I was thinking about trying to utilize now. that and I was like, that that's ain't not going to work. So thank you for the um, recommendation. But getting back to answering your question about hunting tips for going to Montana, first of all, if you haven't, you should watch the Montana hunting trip video that Ethan put on out last year, mm -hmm. um, because I think you actually talked about like a packing list and some of the things that you brought on that we trip. We did on some of the, they were just general traveling videos. Um, and then okay. what we ended up seeing, well, that was the well, thing is I did a project for Kent, um, who is the the official ammo of Standing Stone Kennels. We did a, a... Like a social media takeover. Yes. So all of those videos ended up being stuff that they utilized. Oh. And we shot um, vertically for their stories. Instagram stories. Yep. And they have not been used for anything else. So unfortunately... Oh, I thought that you had a... Well... 
The packing was for Texas. That was a different either one. way, though. Go back to our channel, subscribe, watch some of our hunting videos because yeah, please those subscribe. We appreciate it. We do appreciate that because we do actually go over what our normal packing list is when we travel with dogs and go on hunting trips, which are really good things to throw in the truck for you as well. So I would definitely talk about um, things that you're going to need on your hunting trip. So having your pack packing list planned out would be something to um, prepare for ahead of time so that when you're packing the truck, you can check off your list of things that I, you- I always do that. Yes. I make a list and I start, I don't pack. Like some people pack and prepare weeks in advance and months and, and, and days and whatever in advance. I do not do that. I pack right before we leave. And that's a lot of times because I, I'm limited on the number of supplies that I have. So I can't have all my dog dishes sitting packed up in a tote. Because we got to feed go. dogs. Yeah, because I got to feed the dogs. And so I just have a list. And then I add things to that list constantly and organize that list so that I know for sure I've got all the things. And then I don't leave until I have everything checked off that list. Yes. So that would be one tip. Have your packing list. If you need more help figuring out what to put in a packing list, let us know and we can come up with something. That might be a really cool video to do is like the generic what to pack when you go hunting list. That, that's an absolutely great video. Write it down. Producer. Okay. Producer. So um, we also, I want to say another thing that could be really beneficial depending on what you're planning on doing would be some form of map system. And what we're going to be using in Montana this year is on x maps now the only thing that's going to be and you can actually download maps i am 99 percent sure for areas that you're going to be that potentially may or may not have cell phone reception but it will tell you the from a plots almost plot standpoint who is paying the taxes it's not also always who you need to call but who's paying the taxes on that property so that you can figure out how to get a hold of them and it will show all of the public hunting areas, whether that's in out there, a lot of it is um, BLM land, I believe is what it's called. But it will show, it will say, these are the, the public hunting areas that you can go into. And this is, then you can look up from there on websites, whether or not it's a specific area that you may need to have steel shot versus lead shots acceptable or you have to walk in or you drive in most public stuff you have to walk in but um anyhow on x maps is uh something that we'll be utilizing i know for sure yes and then the other two things that i want to mention because yeah we're going on this great hunting trip we've got all of our you know hunting supplies dog supplies packed we know where we want to go we've got that planned out but Things that get overlooked, especially for September trips, is that's pretty early season stuff. Oh, yeah. One, we want to make sure that we've got our dogs in pretty good condition. Condition is huge. So you've got a little over a month-ish, because it isn't the beginning of September. We're not quite to the beginning of August that the, that the season opens. So you've got some more time, but you've got about a month that you can start conditioning your dog so they can be as in good of shape as possible so that you don't get there. And then they're super sore, um, whether their pads are sore or they're just muscles are sore for it, recovery. Pads is a huge thing. So when we went out to Montana last year, I mean, it's a lot of big rolling Hills and some, um, there are some valleys that water runs through, but there were definitely some rockier areas that we hit in we were kind of like the central part of the state. So, but there were some rocky areas that we hit. And if our dogs had not been conditioned and prepared the way that they are, which our dogs begin August 1. So we will have four weeks of solid conditioning before September 1 opens up. And we're planning more like a mid-September trip so that we can get away from a little bit of the heat, but hopefully prevent. Um, last year when we went, it was closer to the end of the month and when the, there was a cold snap that came through just kind of more or less a little early, but randomly, but that cold snap with the grouse aspect of things, a lot of times pushes them into bigger groups and they get flightier. So we makes that, them harder to hunt. Yes. Harder to hunt because the young earlier season groups are smaller, like eight to 12, maybe less eyes. And that's a lot less eyes looking for trouble. Yes. And that first day of hunting. Was, I mean, it was lights out. We were on top of them, birds getting pointed, everything happening. The second day of hunting, that kind of was a rainy day, so it was a little harder to find stuff. And then that cold snap kind of pushed in. 
And that third day of hunting, I mean, we saw groups of 50 to 60 birds, probably give or take. And most of them were flying over the hill, kind of spooky, not, not, oh, just out of shock. No, it was just like, oh, there goes a group, I guess. Uh, goodbye. We, 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 yeah, goodbye. <laughs> so um, we're going to try and balance that a little bit. Um, not, by by no means. Mid-September instead of late September or early September. We're going yeah, to split try. the difference, see try. if that'll work for us. But um, so getting your dogs in shape. And then also I watched the videos but I've never been to Montana, but there's some rolling hills out there. Get your butt in shape. <laughs> Get your butt in shape. Ooh. So um, if you follow along on our YouTube channel, which I hope you do, and I hope you subscribe, uh, you may have seen a video that we posted recently of me doing a clicker training free shaping video with Zephyr. I was in a boot. I just had surgery on my foot um, for plantar fasciitis, which I've been struggling for about two and a half years with, have tried lots and lots and lots of different things. Um, and finally said, let's try this. It's not full on surgery, but it was called 10 X. Um, but that was my, like, we need to get this done so that my foot can be better because I'm not sitting in the truck crying because I can't hike these hills. So, uh, that was part of me getting my butt in shape is getting my foot fixed, making sure that we have good boots, which we hopefully do with our new Loa Renegades, which is another video we put out about showing um, our first impressions, which my insulated ones with a new pair with a right and a left boot are hopefully on the way. Yeah, I got shipping confirmation on those, so they're Perfect. coming. Perfect, which I won't, I won't need those in September, but I'm hoping that they come, I can try them on, they fit, so we've got them ready for Maybe South Dakota. Well, I started wearing my uninsulated ones already. Kind of just loafing around here. You can try and break them in easy, break my foot into them easy. And I've done a little bit of short amount of hiking. I mean, I probably haven't even put two miles on them, maybe at the most. And all of that being said, so far they feel really comfortable. And what I plan to do is to show a true workup of how these boots are going to hold up to what I'm doing this fall. And... I'm going to take a day, a picture, the first day that I start hunting in them. And then I'm going to take a picture every single day through the end of the season and do like a video montage, time, time lapse. Yeah, a video time lapse would be the right word and show you the wear and tear that the boots take. And then we'll do a recap kind of on how well they actually held up. That'll be coming out uh, when I finish, finish, which will probably be. Cabin fever is like the March, last hunt yeah. in March. So. so it'll be September through March hunting season, basically. Yeah. So, yep, and yep, I yep. haven't really gotten a chance to wear and break mine in because of this foot surgery. So uh, hopefully when Which that I will switch is away from, from the uninsulated ones at some point in time in there. But yeah, you'll have still. to. But then when we come back to Kansas for some of the other stuff that we do late season. Or on, on, on insulated mostly all uninsulated. Mostly uninsulated, yeah. yeah. So anyway, where was I going with that? Oh, getting your butt in shape. Get your butt in shape. I digressed. So get your butt in shape. Um, Eat make sure less, that you, move more. Yeah. Simple stats. And make sure that you have, um, you know, the proper gear and equipment for yourself as well. So that was a really good question. And we still have time for more. Love it. Next question is from Nelly the Kid one on Instagram. Nelly the Kid. Scariest thing to happen to you while you were hunting? <sighs> well, I believe I know yours. Okay. Well, what's yours then? Or do you want me to tell my story? Tell yours. I'm going to have to think a little bit because okay. I really haven't had too many scary things. I've had a few, but not enough that really like jump out and hit me as super, super scary. Okay. So my scariest was falling through the ice mm -hmm. in South Dakota. Is that what you thought? Yeah. That's what I was. I, that would have been my, I mean, that would top my list if I'd ever done anything like that. Yeah. So falling through the ice in South Dakota, um, we were hunting along the edge of a slough, uh, cattail slough. And, uh, I was walking along the edge. The ice was super solid. Everything seemed fine until it wasn't. And then I fell through about up to my chest. That was my saving grace. Like I was just along the edge and it uh, wasn't actually deep enough to go above my chest. Um, because otherwise I don't know how I would have actually gotten out. Um, so I actually fell through, kept my gun above the ice, um, and then used some of the cattails along the edge and kind of laid out on the ice and pulled myself out. But then we had, who? how long do you think it was until we got back to the truck? 
Oh, 30 minutes or an hour to an hour, 30 minutes to an hour range. Yeah. And so I was soaked clear up to my chest in ice water. Um, there's snow on the ground. It was, I don't even know how cold it was out below freezing. I would say it was cold. Um, it was cold. And, uh, my saving grace was I kept moving. Um, and as soon as we got back to the truck, I changed out of all that wet gear. Um, I borrowed a pair of pants from one of the other girls that was hunting with us. Jess, actually, mm-hmm. um, I had to wear my wet boots, but she had a dry pair of socks. So I tried to get as much moisture out of those boots as possible. And then, um, I had to wear my same wet coat and wet vest and stuff, but got a chance to dry out a little bit and warm up, which was the important thing in the truck after that happened. Uh, but that was pretty scary. It was definitely one of those like panic moments. Um, and then you go, Oh my gosh, how am I going to get out of this? But then it really made me start thinking, I'm like, this was scary. And I was able to get out and I'm a human. And I thought through this process. Um, and so it made us really cautious about letting the dogs go out on the ice at all. Um, because if it was going to break through for me, I'm definitely heavier than our dogs, but, um, there's weak spots in the ice that they could have busted through. And if it had been out in the middle of a pond, it would have been a pretty scary situation. So I would say that I have a couple scarier situations, not scarier than that. I mean, just scary situations, hunting, and all of them have been dog related. So, um, specific to you and this, what you just said made me think of another one, but See, I've been really, really fortunate. Um, I've not really had an accident. I've not really had anything. Yeah, knock on all the things. Um, I've been very fortunate. And I would say when I started guiding, like my first real guiding gig, I was at Greystone Castle, which is a place down in Texas, right outside of Dallas, Fort Worth area, about a little less than an hour. It's a really cool facility. It's an Orbis and place. And I mean, it's top notch. If you want to go top notch, give me a call. Uh, set it up and I will come hunt with you down there. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's cool. So the whole place looks like a castle. I mean, it's, it's, it's very cool. And they've so, done a lot of updating and remodeling recently, which I makes was, it look yeah. like we've watched some of their new promotional videos and things like that. It looks, it looks nice. nice. Yeah. It looks really nice. I've, we go to uh, an event or have for quite a few years. It's in Fort Worth and they always do like Greystone always does some donation hunts and stuff. And I always try and buy them, but they're always, you know, just uh, above my pay grade, basically. So we, um, but I'd love to go back someday. Maybe we'll make it work sometime. Maybe. the um, I was there hunting, and this was with Grandpa Rex. Everybody that follows us knows Grandpa Rex. So this is going on like. Well, he's almost 15, so. This would be nine or 10, 10 years probably ago. Probably 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Um, we were hunting this area, and it had... Uh, it had like a ditch kind of, and the road was raised up. And so there's a big elevation change from where we were at. And these birds came out of the cover and flew up that way. And the dogs were headed up that way towards where the birds were. Well, they're climbing that elevation. Yeah. And we're standing down low where the road is about shoulder height ish, or just a little bit lower. But I see a shot come across the road and the shot all hits the road. And then Rex pops up, you know, I mean, it was like that fast. It was like, boom, Rex is here. So literally a split second second. before Rex lost his life and seeing things like, or got seriously injured. But at that distance, I would, I would guess it would have been more than seriously injured. So that was very scary. The, but it was dog related, right? Yeah. And we've talked about this in other videos about like safe hunting practices and keeping in mind elevation changes and where the dogs are at when you're taking those shots, because no one bird, no, any bird are as worth the potential of shooting a dog or let alone another person that you're not as aware of where they're at. So knowing where you're shooting is very important. But that was scary. It was eye opening to me. And I put more emphasis on educating people and trying to help keep focus and Safety Um, talks, safety talks, safety talks. And and learning about how to help handle people that maybe are not as familiar with the dogs being around. And since then, I do a lot less guiding for different groups. I do a lot of guiding for the same people every year. And you get to know those people. They respect you. They respect the dogs that you have out there. And that becomes a good relationship. Now, a few years ago, this is another, it's a dog related thing. So I had help and another gentleman was running dogs with me 
And I went down to block at the end of the field. And it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing. I pulled down to block. There's supposed to be a few trucks following me. And then they start marching down the field. Well, I get out and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing happens. And then I see trucks like tearing down the road and getting out of there. And it's like this scary feeling because something happened, happened down there. But I can't get anybody on the phone. And then finally I get a phone call that one of the dogs had gotten hit and run over on the road, which is where we were at. So it's always, we always put a huge, 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 huge emphasis on where our dogs are at, which is why our program is primarily based around obedience. Um, Keeping your dogs under control before hitting the field in a heel position, which is why yes. we put so much emphasis on healing and off lead healing. So when your dogs are out of the vehicle before you hit the field, before everybody's organized, you can keep them where they're under control, where you can keep an eye on them, even while people are still grabbing their gear and getting vehicles moved around and maneuvered around because well, things yes. like this could happen. Yes. And and the worst part is you hear uh, it was on a road, right? So you think somebody driving by hit the dog. No, it was somebody pulling out to, to go down, down into and the block. field. They weren't paying enough attention. And the dog was, you know, kind of running around. Excited. And and- they literally pulled out less than two, three feet. And just, well, probably five feet, but it was a very short distance. It was just pulled out, clunk, clunk. And big truck, There, I mean, there was no chance, but it was just a, it was a bad deal. And it was very scary. And it put me in a situation, I'm like, I'm getting goosebumps right now just talking about it. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And not only did that ruin the whole situation, it ruined the day, it ruined the hunt, it ruined, it ruined everything. So, um, you know, being able to be aware. And since then, I've been even more aware. Now, I, again, knock on all the things, have never had anything happen to one of my dogs. While we've or, been hunting like that. Yeah, no. no. But it was one of those things that it was very scary and very eye-opening. And then last comes back with Kat was talking about, this was not on the same trip, but it was on the next trip. and Because we, we just, knew about the ice. Yes, we just had that scary experience and we were hunting with some other people. And I am, again... We we're hunting the edge of this pond and this pond is frozen over ish where but it you looks can like see there's soft a little, spots in it. yeah, you could see that change in the ice where it looks soft or it looks discolored ish different from everything and else. And there was even a little bit of water on top of the ice there where it had yes. had some melt happening. No idea. And I'm blocking kind of this edge of the pond. We're trying to avoid the pond, but there's a really good cover along the edge. So keep the dogs out of the pond. You should be fine. It's, um, and this dog comes. Not one of our me. dogs. No, it was another guy that we we're hunting with. And the dog comes up to me and it's right on the edge of this pond. And I'm like calling the dog to me, trying to get the duck coaxing. Hey, puppy, puppy, let's go this way. Like, let's just walk. And he's like, Meh, runs right through the middle Straight of the pond. And I'm sitting pond. here going, <sighs> like, right, I just watched waiting it for this my dog to break through the ice and disappear. And I mean, like there is zero way. I mean, somebody will die in the process of trying to get out there to save that dog. And unfortunately, I mean, in the the laws of value, I guess, if that's the word you want to use, I mean, nobody needs to die in that situation. But and you it's would just horrible. hope and it's pray that that dog could get enough purchase on the edge of the ice and pull themselves out. I mean, it's a best, very scary it, situation. We don't, we don't have would, any ropes. We don't have any, you're, uh, you know, a half a mile from the truck again. What are you going to do? And you I'm know, fast, I'm not that fast. Yeah. And it was definitely, um, scary. Luckily, knock on wood. Thank goodness. Nothing happened. That dog didn't break through. The ice was tougher than it looked. Um, but we were like, once that dog got back across the pond, we grabbed him and we're like, dude, listen, here. you are not going across that pond Stay any more here. times. Yeah. So, um, but no, I watched that happen and that was very scary too. Cause it had recently, it was like the next trip up to South Dakota after I'd fallen through that I watched this dog do that. And I was like, this is going to be bad. Well, luckily and, it wasn't. In, I mean, in all honesty, I mean, at this point, Maybe somebody could refresh me that hunts with us could refresh my memory, but I, I can't think of any other. I've had some stories. I mean, yeah. we could tell some hunting stories. Some but lacerations as far as, and things like that. As far like as that. really scary, scary stuff. Um, those would those be would my be the, scary. Those would be the big ones. Yeah. Yep. That's a really good question. Really good question. A good one to end on for this part. And we will be back shortly with part three. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.